Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. I'm so honored today to have joining me Rabbi Jason Sobel, who has written this wonderful book, Signs and Secrets of the Messiah. We're going to be talking about this today. He was raised in a Jewish home in New Jersey. He dedicated much of his life to finding truth. After years of seeking and studying, he encountered the Lord and found his true destiny as a follower of Jesus, Yeshua. Suddenly, all of the traditions Rabbi Jason grew up with took on new depth and meaning as God connected ancient wisdom with the teachings of the Messiah. And we're excited today to talk about his new book, Signs and Secrets of the Messiah. God bless you, Rabbi. Good to have you joining me. Shalom. It's great to be back with you. Thank you for having me. Well, you're fascinating. You're, you're like Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. You guys freak me out all the time. You, j- just when I think I understand things, I talk to you and realize I don't understand things. And you have such an incredible perspective. This book, you, you know, you talk about numbers, you talk about the prophetic implications of so many different things. But in your book, you start by talking about the wedding at Cana of Galilee and just the prophetic implications of that and what it means. So, so talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, you know, God is in the details. So, you know, the question that we have to ask is why is the first miracle Yeshua, Jesus did the turning the water into wine of all the miracles he could have done? Why is this the first miracle? One of the things that the book of John is trying to demonstrate is that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And the Messiah, according to the five books of Moses, according to the Torah, is going to be a prophet that was going to be greater than Moses. And so one of the things the Messiah had to do, he's had, he had to do Moses-like signs. So think about it for a moment. What's the first miracle Moses did? He turned the water into blood when he went to redeem the children of Israel out of Egypt. So when Yeshua, Jesus, comes as the greater of the Moses, he does his first miracle at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, and he turns the water not into blood, but he turns the water into wine. Why? Because he doesn't come to bring death. He comes to bring life that we might have it more abundantly. And from a biblical and Hebraic perspective, wine is symbolic of the abundance and the blessings of the Messianic kingdom. And this ties back to Genesis 49, the scepter shall not depart from Judah no, the ruler staff between his feet until Shiloh comes to him will be the obedience of the nations. Then it goes on to say they'll tie their donkey to the choicest grapevine and they'll wash their garments in the blood of grapes. There'll be such abundance that that wine, which is valuable, will, will be used for doing the laundry. <laughs> wow. Wow. So what what is the, the word Cana mean? You talk about that. Yeah, there's, you know. There's, he does, Yeshua does his first and second miracle in the book of John in Cana of Galilee. So obviously if he picks that place, there's obviously deep significance to that. And we get into that in Signs and Secrets. One of the significance that we have to understand is Cana or Cana in Hebrew literally means, can mean read. And there's a prophecy in Isaiah. It says this, a bruised reed he will not break. And it's talking about the humility and the gentleness of the Messiah and how much he, he's, he doesn't force himself on individuals, but he's actually has care and concern for their soul. And so he fulfills that prophecy by doing his first miracle in Cana. But what's interesting is that in Hebrew, there are no vowels in the actual text of Hebrew. It's kind of like hangman, right? You got to yeah. know the vowels or guess the vowels or kind of like wheel of fortune. You know, <laughs> you have to you can look at the consonants and, and guess what the word is by having an idea of filling in the vowels. Right. So the same Hebrew consonants that make up the word Cana in Hebrew also make up the word for Melchizedek, who calls God the creator of heaven and earth, the Kone Hashemayim Vehedaretz, right? So the word Kana is also connected to God as creator, and it's also connected to God as redeemer, because the word, the root word Kana can also mean to acquire or to redeem. So Messiah doing this first miracle at Cana points to him as the, his identity wow. as the creator, wow as well as the redeemer of all and it gives us a great definition of what actually redemption is right in exodus 15 it says uses the word kana and it says until the people who i have acquired pass through 
redemption is about acquisition, right? It's about God yeah. buying us out of sin, buying us out of slavery, buying us uh, out of death so that we might be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into uh, the kingdom of light. And it's also a fulfillment of Isaiah 11, which he says uh, he will he will redeem, his hand will redeem a second time. And the word for redeem there again is the same root word as Cana. So it points to him as creator, redeemer, all these things. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the show today. I want to ask you to consider helping us financially to support this ministry, to expand this ministry. I ask you to help us, and many of you did help us financially. We were able to hire an Israel correspondent, uh, Brian Schrager, who's been fantastic. We want to continue to expand this ministry. We want to continue to take this message of Jesus and end time prophecy to people all around the world. Millions of people watch us right now, but we need your support to be able to grow this ministry. If this has touched you, if this has been a blessing to you, would you help us reach more people? Go to give.endtimes.com. You can give a one-time gift. Nothing's too small, nothing's too large. Some of you may have been blessed. You have the opportunity to really be a blessing to other people. I'm asking you to consider giving your most generous gift. You can also give a recurring gift. You can make it a monthly gift, which is a huge blessing to us as a ministry, just to know that that money is going to come in every month to help us to expand and to do everything that we're doing right now. For all of you who have supported us, I want to say thank you for all that you've helped us to do, to go around the world encouraging people about the times we're living in, sharing end time prophecy and sharing Jesus. And I'm asking you to consider, those of you who have and those of you who haven't, please consider giving your most generous gift right now. Give.endtimes.com and you can give your most generous gift there. And listen, if you're not subscribed to this channel on YouTube, be sure and hit the subscribe button. Also, the like button. Subscribe means you're going to get everything that we come out with here on YouTube. The like button means other people are going to find out about it. So if you would, take just a minute, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. God bless you. Well, I, you know, and, and I was reading your, the first chapter there where this is, I never thought about any of that kind of stuff. You know, the Moses and turning the water into blood and water into wine. But you also talk about the six stone water pots at Cana when they ran out of wine. They had six stone pots there. Talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think we have to remember the Bible is not boring. There is rich, and I and I love, because you're such a great teacher of scripture. I love, you're one of my favorite people to listen to. And uh, every detail is there for a reason. Yeah. So when it says six stone pots, God doesn't waste words. There's obviously a reason for the number six. Well, think about the significance of six in the Bible. Man was created on the sixth day. In Jewish thought, we fell on the sixth day. Six is the number of man. And so when Messiah comes, he does his first miracle with six stone pots, and he dies on Friday, Good Friday, which on the biblical calendar is the sixth day of the week, wow. because on the same day we fell, Messiah comes and gives his life uh, to, to restore what was lost. But of course, there is still more, because literally in Hebrew, Hebrew is alphanumeric. So that means there are no Roman numerals in the Bible. If you want to write a number, you have to write it with the letter. So for example, if I say open your Hebrew Bible to the sixth chapter, I'd say open your Bible to chapter Vav because Vav is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet and has a numerical value of six. But the letter Vav is literally the conjunction and. And the first place it occurs, that letter in the Bible, is in Genesis chapter one, one, where there's seven words in Hebrew corresponding to the seven days of creation. And the sixth word of Genesis 1-1 is the sixth letter, Vav. God created the heavens is the fifth. Vav is the sixth. Earth is seventh. So literally the letter Vav, the number six, is the letter that connects heaven and earth. Wow. When we sinned on the sixth day, we broke the connection between heaven and earth. Wow. And that's why Yeshua Jesus dies on Friday. One of the reasons, because he comes to restore the connection that we had lost oh and gosh. restore the abundance and blessings. And that's why six stone pots full to the brim. Wow. The wine reserved from the six days of creation. And there's Jesus. also <clears throat> significance in the fact that this is the beginning of his ministry. 
and of his public ministry. And so there's also significance to the fact that it's a wedding, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I think one of the things Yeshua is constantly doing in his ministry and with his miracles is he wants to give us a sneak preview of what is to come, right? He's proclaiming the kingdom, but he's not just proclaiming the kingdom, he's demonstrating and giving tangible uh, a sneak preview to what we're gonna experience, you know, in the kingdom, right? So one of those things is we know that ultimately when the kingdom is established on earth as it is in heaven, one of the things I know I'm looking forward to is going to the, the marriage supper of the lamb, yeah. right? It's gonna be a, a wedding supper, a marriage yeah. feast. And so of course Yeshua does his first miracle at a wedding because that's ultimately where each and every one of us is heading to that marriage supper of the lamb. He is the groom, we are the bride, and it just shows us that he created us for intimate relationship with him. And it's a little bit about what we have to look forward to wow. when we see him face to face. Well, the so and you know, one of the things that I, I taught before is that, you know, the his ministry started with a wedding and it's going to end with a wedding. You know, it's exactly. you know, the, the beginning and the end match. So the you're great with numbers, the value of numbers in the Hebrew. And so in your book, you talk about Jesus and the serpent and the yeah. numerical value of that. Yeah, just even before we get into that, let me just say this. I think that looking at the numerical value of words is something that's sometimes a little different for believers, for Christians. But to understand that I believe numbers are significant for, you know, a number of reasons. Obviously, the most well-known calculation of the number is 666, right? right? Which, you know, that's, you know, calculate the, the number, and that's how you're going to know connected to the Antichrist. So obviously, it's in the Bible yeah. in a number of different places. That's one of the most common. I think the other really interesting thing is that the significance of the numerical value is that if if you were to go to a university and talk to your average professor who is probably skeptical, secular professor skeptical of the Bible, they'd say, look, you can't read Genesis 1-1 literally because, you know, we, we live in a world of science and mathematics and to say God spoke the world into existence, you know, that's just myth or metaphor. That's the ancients. They really didn't understand. So that's how they could relate to it. But here's the amazing thing. If the if Hebrew is alphanumeric and Greek, by the way, is also alphanumeric, the two languages the Bible is written in, and letters or numbers are interchangeable, when God creates the heavens and earth, when he creates the heavens, the letters form the spiritual background and code of the spiritual reality. He holds all things together by his word. But the numbers form the mathematical basis of creation. So literally, when God speaks the world into existence, he's coding creation. Wow. Letters and numbers form computer code. And so there's no, there's no contradiction. When he speaks the world into creation, he's forming both the mathematical code of creation that underlines quantum physics and all of the sciences, but also the spiritual reality, which is connected to the letters and the words that God uses to speak the world into existence. And if you look at it from that perspective, you could say, you know, sin is a virus in the system, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. That causes everything to crash. So there's no contradiction there. And I think that's important to understand. Um, but with specifically with, you know, John chapter three, the famous, you know, chapter in the Bible, uh, you know, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and wants to understand about who he is as a teacher, the famous, you know, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And in that chapter, he talks about being born again. But then he also talks about as Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole, so the son of man has to be lifted up. And it seems like a strange analogy. Why is Jesus comparing himself to the serpent 
on the pole, which goes back to the book of Numbers, when Moses, God told Moses, make a bronze serpent, lift it on the pole. The people who complained and grumbled against God, who were bitten by the fiery serpents, when they looked at the serpent, they would be healed. Well, here's part of the significance. The numerical value of Messiah in Hebrew is 358. It's also the same numerical value of serpent, Nachash, in Hebrew equals 358. Wow. What's it telling us? Messiah 358 is the cure for the curse that came through the serpent in the Garden of Eden 358. Wow. The evil serpent 358 will be defeated by Messiah 358, who is symbolic of the holy serpent, which ties back to Moses going to Egypt throw down your staff and it will become a snake and ultimately Moses' snake eats up the snakes of the evil snakes of the pharaoh's uh magicians in his court and it's symbolic of death being swallowed up by life wow. and messiah oh my gosh <laughs> you know that you would never get that without talking to somebody like you i mean <clears throat> so in Isaiah, the scripture about wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace, there's a connection there too, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the words bronze serpent in Hebrew equals 1,116. The same numerical phrase in Hebrew as wonderful counselor, mighty God, uh, father of eternity, prince of peace also equals, guess what, 1,116, right? So it points to the fact that the bronze serpent, and this, which is the serpent that Moses is talking about in John chapter 3, points to the identity of the Messiah as the fulfillment of Isaiah 9, 5. Wow. You know, is this a coincidence? <laughs> I don't think so. And of course, there's more. In Hebrew, royal crown, Keter Malkut, also equals 1,116. So the one who is the wonderful counselor, mighty God, you know, prince of peace, father of eternity, 1116, uh, points to Yeshua, who ultimately wears the crown, 1,116. Well, you know, when, like you said, if you went to the average college professor, secular college professor is skeptical, and now the Bible, there's nothing inspired about the Bible. When you get finished, there's something inspired about the Bible. I mean, <laughs> because you, when you take these numbers, you, you just, and you talk about the number 38. So what's so special about the number 38? Yeah, I, well, I think you're right. I think, look, I want to be clear. We don't make doctrines based on the numbers. Right. But, 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 doct but, but the numbers give us further insight into the amazingness of God's word, yeah. right? And yeah. like what you're saying, how this can't be a coincidence that these things connect like that. And a number important number is in, found in the number 38, found in John chapter five, the healing uh, at the pool of Bethesda, there's a detail that this man had been unable to walk for 38 years. Again, if the Bible tells us he couldn't walk for 38 years, there's obviously something significant about that. But what's interesting here is that people think about Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, that's true and not true. Israel was in the wilderness for a to total of 40 years, but Deuteronomy 2.14 tells us that they only wandered because of their disobedience and unbelief for 38 years. It was in the second year that they sent the spies into the land oh. and they brought back an evil report. Yeah. Right. And that's when God says, you'll wander until that generation dies. The first two years they were building the tabernacle. God was giving them the Torah at Mount Sinai. He was preparing them. It was just he was preparing them. But it was in the second year that they disobey and they have to wander for 38 years because of their unbelief and disobedience. Wow. Okay. And so Yeshua is saying to this man, do you want to be like the generation who, because of their unbelief, literally died in the wilderness and could not enter in to the promise? Or are you going to have faith rise, take up your man and walk and enter in to the salvation into the healing wow. that I have for you. And so Yeshua was testing this man because 38 is also the numerical value of the Hebrew phrase libo, which means his heart. 
Hmm. So Yeshua was testing this man like Israel was tested in the wilderness for those 38 years to see what was in their heart. Was he going to have unbelief rooted in hopelessness or was he going to have faith and find healing and wholeness? Hope deferred makes the heart yeah. sick, yeah. but faith leads to it. But faith is a tree of life, right? Wow. Well, you know, part of the interesting thing about that story, because it's almost offensive for Jesus to walk up to a man who's been sick for 38 years and say, do you want to get well? I mean, it's like, yeah. well, you know, you know, I wouldn't say duh, because you know, it's Jesus, but it's like, sure he does. But, but honestly, there was a question of whether he wanted to be well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because I think it's, you know, from my own experience, I mean, you've been in ministry for so long, right? Long, longer than I have. But I mean, the reality is, is that oftentimes, when we've gone through traumas or sickness yeah. for so long, yeah. they begin to shape a core part of our identity. Absolutely. It becomes part and parcel of who we are. And it becomes very hard to separate, you know, who we've been from where we're becoming, right? This is again, the children of Israel, when they come out of Egypt, they saw signs and wonders they get mana from heaven and they're complaining about the food in the desert and talking about going back to <laughs> yeah. Egypt to slavery yeah. because man, they had really good fish that was really tasty in Egypt. Between between I meetings. Mean, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it seems like I mean you would think what's wrong with these people? But but right, but they had a slave mentality. Yeah. It's hard to break. Yeah from the hurts and the pains and the things that have defined us for so long. And so this was a real question. I mean, this man had made his, you know, he'd been trapped. But Yeshua was saying to this man, listen, do you want to be made well? Do you, do you, I know you felt trapped. You felt like nothing ever changes for you. And it's interesting because when Yeshua asked the man, does he want to be made well? Does he want to be made well? It shows you he was testing what was in his heart because the man doesn't respond yes. <laughs> Yeah. He responds with a reason why he hasn't been healed yet. Yeah. I've got no one to take me down and put me in the water when the water's stirred and people, that's not what Yeshua asked. Yeah, that's right. And you know, <laughs> in 38 years, Rabbi, if you wanted to get in the water, you'd get there somehow. You know, you, you could figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, so, but what's also interesting is that 38 is the numerical value in Hebrew of the root for sickness oh, wow. in Hebrew. Oh, wow. So literally 38 is the numerical value for sickness or weakness. And this man represents those who have weak faith, who are physically and emotionally and relationally sick and hurting and just kind of stuck. But the good news is that Yeshua has the power yes. to heal. He's the ultimate hope dealer I mean, hope is the belief that your future can be better than your past. You don't have to yeah. remain where you are. Y Yeshua can, can heal you and give you hope. I love that. We want to continue to expand this ministry. We want to continue to take this message of Jesus and end time prophecy to people all around the world. Millions of people watch us right now, but we need your support to be able to grow this ministry. If this has touched you, if this has been a blessing to you, would you help us reach more people? Go to give.endtimes.com. You can give a one-time gift. Nothing's too small, nothing's too large. Some of you may have been blessed. You have the opportunity to really be a blessing to other people. I'm asking you to consider giving your most generous gift. You can also give a recurring gift. You can make it a monthly gift, which is a huge blessing to us as a ministry, just to know that that money is gonna come in every month to help us to expand and to do everything that we're doing right now. For all of you who have supported us, I want to say thank you for all that you've helped us to do, to go around the world encouraging people about the times we're living in, sharing end time prophecy and sharing Jesus. And I'm asking you to consider, those of you who have and those of you who haven't, please consider giving your most generous gift right now. Give.endtimes.com and you can give your most generous gift there. And listen, if you're not subscribed to this channel on YouTube, be sure and hit the subscribe button. Also, the like button. Subscribe means you're going to get everything that we come out with here on YouTube. The like button means other people are going to find out about it. So if you would, take just a minute, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. God bless you. Now, you know, the number seven is the number that, you know, seven days of creation, you know, just all kinds of sevens in the Bible. But you're, you 
kind of come from a different perspective related to the number seven. What, what's your perspective? Yeah, it's what's, you know, what's, what's interesting with the number seven is that a number of different things. So one is there's seven in a number of different places in the New Testament that are significant. Another miracle that we talk about is the second uh, miracle at the at uh, at Cana, right? Which is the healing of the royal official son. Right. And what's interesting is he says that he heals his son at the seventh hour. Yeshua spoke the word from a distance, and the man's son was healed at the exact time he spoke the word. He finds out, and it's at the seventh hour. What's interesting: the seventh hour, according to Jewish tradition, according to the Midrash, is the hour that God breathed the breath of life into Adam. Wow! And so this Yeshua is you know, from Yeshua is a source of life, right? He's breathing life into this man, is this man's son, right? We also know seven is the number of completion and wholeness. Yeshua is bringing a complete healing and wholeness to this man's son. Seven is the number of the messianic age, according to the rabbis, right? This world is likened to the six days of creation. This world is like the six days, and when the Messiah comes, it's like the seventh day, um, which is the time that's, the messianic kingdom in Jewish thought is a time that's known as all Shabbat, right? So Shabbat is seen as a time of rest. So seven is associated with rest. It's associated with the kingdom. It's associated with trust. We see this in a number of places, right? God tells the children of Israel in the wilderness, you'll collect manna for six days, enough for the day. You can't save it for the next day or else it's going to go putrid. But then on the seventh day, he tells them the reverse. He tells them you have to collect enough manna for two days for the Friday and Saturday so you don't have to work on the Sabbath. It's teaching them about trust, about provision. We see this again on the next level when the children of Israel go into the land. It's the Shemitah, the sabbatical year. Right. God tells the children of Israel, you'll work the land six years but the seventh year, you're to let the land lie fallow and not work the land. Think about how much trust that would take to not farm when oh, your gosh. food oh. was dependent upon yeah. that. And they never did it. No, they actually, they never did. And they went into exile, yeah. Book of Daniel, <laughs> 70 times yeah. 7, because they did it. <laughs> but 7 is about trusting God to possess your promise even in the oh. if, even in the face of the impossible and improbable that's why there's seven types of canaanite people in the land including giants when they go to wow. take the land of jericho march around the city seventh day on the seventh day you're to march around it seven times yeah. and blow the shofar okay so victory is connected to the number seven that god will give success from our enemies and our obstacles even when it seems like crazy. I mean, just march around the walls, really? But yeah, that's how God operates. You know, there's seven days of Passover. Seven is a number of miracle of multiplication. Yeshua tells his disciples, hey, we got to feed the crowds that have come and hear, hear me speak. And they're literally in the wilderness, like Israel was in the wilderness for those 40 years, and God provided for them in the wilderness. And so Yeshua is going to do a, a greater miracle he takes five loaves and two fish, total, totals of seven, multiplies it to feed the people. And that's the question. Will we trust God? The seven is about trusting God, resting in God yeah. to provide and, you know, do a lot with the little that you have. And I'll never forget, we had this event, one of our first ministry events with Fusion. There wasn't enough food because more people came than we expected i guess we had little faith about how many people are going to show up <laughs> I've done that and all we could do is pray yeah. all we could do is pray lord multiply it like the bread and the fish and god literally multiplied it wow and we actually had leftovers i was like all right lord amazing <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot of times we see god as kind of the slave driver imagine that you get one year off every seven years I mean, that's pretty fantastic. You know, the, I, I found out over the years, first of all, he's not the slave driver I am. You know, we're, we're the ones who won't stop. But the other thing is, and you said this exactly right, it is, it is an issue of trust, is yeah. that if we would obey him and enter into his rest and trust him, I was all stressed out one time in the ministry 
and the Lord told me to go play golf. I had I had been so stressed out, I hadn't played golf in years, and the Lord literally spoke to me and said, go play golf. And I thought to myself, I can't because the church needs me. And the Lord, the Lord spoke, just spoke this to my heart and said, I'll take care of the church. And I was thinking to myself, well, do you know how? And of course, that's the stupidest thought in the whole world. But the Bible says that God gives to his beloved while they sleep. And yeah. so the, when we're obedient to the Lord and trust him, he's able to do more in six than we can do in seven if we just trust him. That, that's, a, that's a big lesson there. Oh, absolutely. I think one of the things with the whole taking the children out of Egypt and connected to the number seven in the mana is, you know, part of the immaturity, part of the slave mentality of Israel is that they learn during their times of slavery in Egypt to look to the hands of people yeah. instead, in, instead of looking to the hand of God. Yeah. They were dependent upon their human masters instead of their heavenly master and father, right? Yeah. And so he's trying to break them of that slave mentality to say, listen, don't trust in people, right? I mean, your, your trust, your future, your destiny isn't determined by people. It's determined by me, and therefore I'm going to teach you to trust me. So part of the reason for the Sabbath, part of the reason for the sabbatical year is that if you can't take a rest, you're still a slave in Egypt. Wow. You're still a slave yep. to the material. You're yep. still a slave to the physical. You're living on the level of the natural. You're living on the level of this world. You're not living on the level of the supernatural, wow. which is the life that we're meant to have yeah. in Jesus. Right. We're not ordinary anymore. The water into wine is ordinary to extraordinary. When he touches your life, you become something else. You're yeah. no longer just subject to this world. You can rise above just these things. And so I think that's part of the significance of the number seven. It's like God can do something supernatural with you if you trust him, if you give him your lows, if you give him your fish, if you say, I'm not going to be a slave, but I'm going to choose to have faith and trust God, I know Jesus, you got this. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fantastic. One, one more question, and I wanna encourage people, this is Rabbi Jason Sobel. Um, it says, Signs and Secrets of the Messiah, a fresh look at the miracles of Jesus. It's fascinating. Um, but you talk about when Jesus did miracles on the Sabbath, uh, the Pharisees took offense at that, but you believe that was prophetic, is that right? Yeah, a absolutely. Again, so I think that part of it has to do with when they get upset at him for healing on the Shabbat. One of those times is, again, the healing of, of the man at the pool of Bethesda. It says he actually healed on a, John 5 says he, it, he went up on a holiday, right? And I believe the key to understanding the miracle on a greater level is understanding which holiday it was. And I believe we get into into the book, but quickly, I believe the holiday was Pentecost Shavuot. It was the day that God gave the 10 commandments at Mount Sinai. And according to Jewish tradition, he gave the commandments on a Shabbat. But part of what happened as well as he was preparing to give the people the Ten Commandments, Jewish tradition says he healed everyone who was lame, everyone who was uh, deaf, and everyone who was blind. Because God was entering into the people, he was entering into a covenant for all time with the people. Right. He didn't want anyone to say, well, I didn't hear that, or I couldn't see that, or I didn't agree to that, so therefore uh, it doesn't apply to me. <laughs> And so he wants to give his whole word to a whole people so that they can wholly enter into the covenant. So here's the point. Yeshua does the same miracle that that was done on the first Pentecost. Yeshua is saying, I'm only doing what I saw my father do. Wow. The father did this at on Sabbath when I, when he brought you out of Egypt on this holiday. I'm only doing what he did. And so again, the question to you, leaders of this gener of his generation, are you going to be like the ten spies and and the you know who right. who gave a bad report, 
and again, didn't enter into the promise, but died in their unbelief? Or are you going to have faith that I'm doing what my father did and enter into the fullness of the promise? Wow. And I think part of the beautiful thing here, too, is that Yeshua does these miracles to fulfill prophecy, to build our faith. But he also promises that greater things than these we can do. I believe part of the importance of understanding and looking at the miracles of Jesus is that if we are going to impact the world, we can't just be about the natural. We have to operate and live right. from the place of the supernatural, the yeah. power of the spirit. And we have to take those words serious. Greater things than these you will do. So Yeshua heals this man on Pentecost. Well, guess what? Peter follows in his footsteps, and in the book of Acts around Pentecost, there's a man sitting at the gate, and he lays hands on him, and he says, silver and gold have I none, but I have in the name of Jesus. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. He heals the man who couldn't walk, doing exactly what he saw Jesus do. Wow. And I can tell you, i just tell you this one thing real quick. When I first came to faith, one of the first things that happened was I got a telephone call from a friend of mine who was homeless who needed to have both legs amputated. I went to the hospital to see him, laid my hands on him. I just read the book of Acts. Jesus said we could do these things, <laughs> prayed for him. He, he needed to have both legs amputated from frostbite. The doctors thought there was no hope. God healed his legs. He got up and he walked out of the hospital, came to Praise faith God. in the Lord. Wow. Listen. We can do the greater things than these. It is possible. Absolutely. Love that. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, you know, I heard someone say one time, one of the reasons that it doesn't happen is we don't believe it'll happen. You know, so we don't go to the ho hospital and pray for people, but he, but he received Christ, you know. Exactly. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He healed people and they, the, the multitudes came to him. Signs and secrets of the Messiah, a fresh look at the miracles of Jesus. And we've just talked today here for a few minutes about this and it's just absolutely fascinating this is the kind of book when, when i was reading this book it just feeds you it's just the, it's just you sit there it's fascinating but it just feeds you it feeds your faith so i want to encourage people to get the book rabbi it's always so good to have you with us and i look forward to having you back shalom it's always great to be with you thank you for the amazing uh, work that you're doing to you know, build marriages and to prepare people for the return of the Lord. We got to get ready. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you guys for joining us today for the Tipping Point Show. We'll see you next time. God bless you. Goodbye. <laughs>